hopefully she didn't hype me up too much. I appreciate it. Um, normally this would be the part where I, you know, kind of warn you and tell you that I'm not Pastor David, but I think that's pretty clear at this point. I think we're all kind of on the same page, so thank you guys for hanging out, but we're just going to jump right into this because this morning um, we're going to read through a lot of scripture. I'm just going to warn you, and it's kind of one of those things that I was thinking about it before because I'm like, I've got to manage their expectations. Like, we're going to read through a whole chapter in the Bible, and I started thinking, I'm like, how silly is that, that that's even a thought in my head, that I've got to warn you that we're in church and we're going to read the Bible. Like, it's kind of one of those things. But that is the world we live in. So just to kind of give you a heads up, we're going to read through a lot of Scripture. Um, the good thing is, it's 1041. So if you listen well and you receive well, we'll be out of here quick. I'm not a long-winded person, so you might even be able to get to the restaurant before the crowds. It is possible. So I'm not going to guarantee anything because if you don't listen well, like Pastor David always jokes, it's kind of serious. Like if I feel like I have to dig it out more than I probably should, we could be here a little bit longer than, than you know, I, I, can, I can talk in circles and we can kind of do this thing. We can hang out till 1145, 12 if we need to. But I think you guys can handle it. I think we'll be all right. I think we can read through a whole, a whole chapter in the Bible. Um, so if you want to get your Bibles out and go ahead and turn to uh, James 1, um, that's where we're going to be reading from. Um, and it's funny because I'm pretty sure, like I was reading through, I'm like, I'm pretty sure the last time I preached, I preached from James 1 because um, I was reading through this and it, like I hit that section. I'm like, I'm almost positive this is the same exact book that I preached out of. But you know what? It's a good book. I, I enjoyed it. I, I'll be honest with you, if, if we had enough time and there was enough, we re literally could read all the way through James because it... I, it's just, it's good stuff in there. There's great information in there, and it applies to us as Christians. I mean, the whole Bible applies to us as Christians, right? But it applies to where we're at very, very, in, in a good way. But I'm going to read, I'm going to first read, Miss Susan, I'm going to read verse 23 through 25, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to just jump into this thing. So um, we're going to skip down to verse 23, like I said, to start, and it says... For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying, he is like a man who looks very careful, carefully at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what he looked like. But he who looks carefully into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and faithfully abides by it, not having become a careless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he will be blessed and favored by God in what he does in his life of obedience. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that you've given me, God. I pray that I would do it justice, God, that, that you would speak through me, that you would implant something into everyone's hearts this morning, God, that you would make yourself real in this place, God, that you would have your way. Father, I pray that lives would be changed, that marriages would be healed, bodies would be healed. Whatever it is that you want to do this morning, we give you free reign and an ability to do it, God. I thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. So, that's what got me here. That scripture, that little section right there is what got me here because I was thinking about it. I'm like, I'm really enjoying kind of where Pastor David's had us as a church for the last couple weeks. Last week, he was talking about the plastic surgery church. And, you know, I mean, it just makes sense. He's talking about plastic surgery church, just kind of in my head. I'm like, you know, the, I thought about this scripture. He's talking about looking at yourself in the mirror carefully and then walking away and immediately what you forgot about, you know, the whole thing. But when, when you're preaching and when anytime I'm reading a scripture or whatever it may be, it's a good habit for you guys and, you know, for myself. If you're going to read that scripture, back all the way up to the beginning and read the whole thing. You never want to just pick one scripture out and read it and, like, base your revelation of who God is off of one scripture because there's so much more to it. So I backed up a couple of verses and read it. I'm like, man, that's good stuff. And I backed up a little bit more and I read it. I'm like, man, that's good stuff. And then I read the whole chapter. I'm like, man, that's really good stuff. And then I read the next chapter. Like I said, if we had time, just kept going. I'm like, man, this, this, whole, um, this whole chapter is really good stuff. So we're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read it. Just a little bit of backstory. Um, you'll see in here it's, it, it says he's writing this to the 12, tri 12 tribes that are scattered about. Basically, James is writing this, 
book to Christians that are scattered about the Roman Empire. At this time, this is after Stephen was martyred. The church was being persecuted pretty heavily, and they all kind of just scattered about the Roman Empire. So you've got all these little sects and these little places and groups of Christians that are meeting in homes and are meeting wherever they can meet, but they don't have the support of like the large church structure. So he's writing to these people. He's like, hey, you're in the middle of a mess. You know, things are a little messed up. We just saw, you know, that the Christians are being persecuted. James was just martyred, the whole thing. So he's writing to these people, and this whole chapter is just dealing with testing your faith. It's dealing with enduring through things and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're just going to start in verse 1. I'm going to stop here and there and just read some stuff. But starting in verse 1, it says, oh, and just kind of bear with it. We Susan didn't realize, and I didn't either. I'm reading out of Amplified. Um, it sometimes is not the easiest to read through because it's got all the brackets and parentheses and all this stuff. But every time I try to get away from the Amplified and read something else, I just come back to it because there's so much more context added in there. But she's got the Amplified Classic, so some of the stuff up there may be a little bit different because it's a little older. They redid the Amplified back in, like, 2015, and I love it. I, it it's, it's one of my favorites because it's just got context added to it. It's all based off the original um, Greek and Hebrew. So if you see the stuff in bra brackets, it's just adding context, adding more information than what's there. So don't like let it mess with you if that one's just a little bit different than what I'm reading, or if you're seeing like if you're hearing me read things that maybe don't you don't see in your translation. Just bear with me, but I love it. Anytime I preach, you're probably going to have to deal with it, so you might as well just get used to it. <laughs> anyway, um, James, a bond servant of God and the um, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the Gentiles in the dispersion. Greetings. Rejoice. So then go into verse 2. Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. That's where we're starting. That's what I'm saying, this whole chapter. So it starts off, very first thing. Consider it joy, brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials. You notice there he doesn't say if. At no point during this does he say if. There, is, there are some certain things that are guaranteed in this life. Right? Taxes. Death, trials, you, it's going to happen. You're born, you die, you pay taxes, and all through the middle of that, you go through trials. It will happen. How you look at those trials, how you view those trials, and how you deal with those trials determine what you get out of them. We'll come back to that in a minute. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance which leads to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Do you guys know how endurance is built? Anybody in here do any kind of endurance sport or ever did? Running, biking, swimming, Anything that you would consider endurance-based, you can raise your hand. It's okay. No one's going to judge you. Maybe they will a little bit. I don't know. Do you know, and this is like super deep and super profound, but do you know the best way to build endurance when you're doing endurance sports is to endure. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. If you want to be a runner and you want to run 10 miles, the only way to get good at running and to run 10 miles is to run a mile and then run a mile and a half and then run a mile because your legs hurt and then run a mile and three quarters and then run half a mile because you're having a bad day and then run two miles. That is the only way to build endurance. There's no secret. There's no secret formula. There are things you can do to help and there are th things you can do to hurt. But as a whole, the only way to build endurance is to endure. The only way to get good at something when you're talking about dealing with endurance is to do it. And I, the older I get, the more I have been around this thing, the more that this kind of stuff, I love it. Because there's no miracle. There's no transfiguration. He doesn't take you from the valley and just shoot you up to the top of the mountain and you're there and you're like, ah, I'm here. This is awesome. doesn't happen. You have to endure the process. And that is something that a lot of Christians today, a lot of people today, don't want to hear. 
And I understand it because for years and years growing up, because like I said, like Miss Lisa said, I've been a part of Pastor David's ministry since I was nine. I was born in the church. Literally, I don't. I could probably count outside of vacations on two hands the amount of Sundays I've missed outside of going on a scheduled family vacation. It's one of those things. We grew up in church. I, there's never a time in my life that I don't remember being a part of a church, being in church, my dad being in ministry, my mom being in ministry, me being in ministry. I, 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 there, there's no time that I don't, it's never happened. So, and I don't say that to brag. I say that to say I've been around this thing for a long time. And I've been around enough place, people and places and churches to know that the thing that gets the amens and the thing that gets the excitement and builds the joy and has people jumping are, are, are the times when people see someone miracled out of something. They see them dealing with something, whether it's an addiction or whether it's sickness or whatever, and they see this miracle and they see this thing happen and it's everybody jumps for joy and it's amazing. And those things are great. Miracles are a great sign for the non-believer. But for the rest of us in here, there are times, more often than not, when you get into that mess and you get into that stuff and the answer is not a miracle. The answer is, Endure the process, because when you come to the other side of the process, you're going to be that much stronger than when you went in. It's not, it's not fun, it's not exciting, it's not glamorous, but it's reality. Endure the process. You know, I mean, it says, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance. And in brackets here, it says, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. Um, another version of it, Susan, you don't have to go there, but I just threw this in there because it breaks it down a little farther. Is in Romans, um, I didn't put the chapter, I'm sorry. In Romans, it says, um, and not only this, but with joy, let us exalt in our sufferings and rejoice in our hardships. Knowing that hardships or dis distress, pressure, trouble produces patient endurance. And endurance produces proven character or spiritual maturity. And proven character produces hope and confident assurance of eternal salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. It's a lot of words there. But the big thing is he says exalt or rejoice, whatever you want to say, in our sufferings. Rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship produces patient endurance. Patient endurance. I don't, like I said, I know some of you guys have done some endurance things and some haven't. But I can tell you, when you're out on like a long run, you know, I mean, I, it, I'm working my way up to doing a, a 50K in like three weeks or something, which is like 31 miles, which is absolutely stupid. Don't do it. It's dumb. There's no reason, it, I don't, I can't explain it, but, and I can tell you that if you get impatient in the middle of a 10 or 12 or whatever mile run, if you get to mile two and you get impatient or mile three, you got a long way to go when you know like, hey, I'm running a, I don't know, 13 mile race or whatever it is, and you get to mile four and you're like, I hate this, like I don't want to be here. That cycle starts in your head, and then the next six, seven, eight miles are going to be miserable. More miserable. I mean, it's, it's, mis it's running. It's miserable from start to finish. We all know that. But it's going to be more miserable if you can't keep your brain in check. But if you can look at it, like it says here, with patient endurance, knowing that endurance is going to pro provide character or spiritual maturity and character, hope, hope, confident assurance in salvation, such hope never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So it's a process. And that's a word that a lot, like I said, people don't want to hear the word process. They don't want to think about it. They don't like it. But just know, like count it joy when you're dealing with stuff. Because you're, like I said, you're going to deal with stuff. You're going to have setbacks in your job. You're going to show up one day, and they're going to be like, hey, we're downsizing your department. It's been a great 15 years. Here's a handshake and a pat on the back. See ya. You know what I mean? That's, that stuff happens. You're gonna, your kids are going to grow up. They're going to get to an age where they resent you. 
I worked in youth ministry long enough to see the cycle time and time and time and time again. You have these kids that are there. They're consistent. They're good kids. They're great kids. They love the Lord. And something happens along the way. They get a little shaken up. They're going to go through that season. It's going to happen. But know that if you endure it and you don't let that shake your faith, and they see you consistent, and they look at you, and they see, like, hey, I just cussed my mom out, flipped off my dad, kicked the dog, whatever it is, and they're looking at me still with love. Yeah, I can see the frustration in their eyes, but they're consistent. It didn't shake their faith. It didn't shake who they are. They're enduring through the process. If they look at you and see that, then they're going to know eventually, like, hey, there's something to this God thing. There's something to this religion or whatever it is because... I've hit them with everything I've got. I've seen them get hit with all kinds of different stuff, and they've stayed consistent. So, yeah, I'll I'll get off endurance for a moment. Don't worry. Um, Going to verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he is to ask of God, who gives everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. And I put a scripture, or actually I put a note from my uh, Bible that I was studying with because I loved it. So pay close attention because it's talking about wisdom. It says wisdom means practical discernment. It begins with respect for God, leads to right living, and results in increased ability to tell right from wrong. I'm going to read it again and pay attention to it. Wisdom means practical discernment. Practical discernment. Not exciting, not supernatural, not this crazy thing. Wisdom just means practical discernment. But it begins with respect for God, leads to right living, and results in increased ability to tell right from wrong. And it says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through, and it's in brackets, but it says to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. So there's no excuse. If you're going through a hard time and you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know the correct way to walk through this. I don't, I don't have the answers. Well, here's the answer. If you lack wisdom, ask. Ask. There's more to it than just asking. And it comes with what we're doing right now, which is reading the Bible. Like, there's a lot that goes to it. But it starts with asking. You ask for wisdom. And that wisdom will guide you through the decision and the circumstances that you're in. And it says here, ask God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. So God doesn't look at you and say, hey, dummy, I gave you the Bible. I gave you thousands and thousands of years of previous people's experience. Like you have all these, it's not what he says. He, he will give it to you. He'll use Holy Spirit. He'll speak to you. When you read the Bible, he'll give you context. He'll give you things. He'll bring things out and say, hey, you see how this person handled it? That's how you should handle it. You see how Jesus talked about this situation, how he viewed this, how he viewed that? That's how you do it. He will give you that wisdom. But you got to ask. It's pretty simple, right? And then verse 6 gives it a little bit more, puts a little bit more in your, in your courts because it says, but he must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown around and tossed in the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable and restless in all his ways, in everything he thinks, feels, or decides. So it's saying, not only do you ask for wisdom, but don't ask flippantly, don't ask fake, don't ask, like, God, give me wisdom, and be like, I know he's not going to give me anything, he's not going to answer me. Every time I pray for something, he doesn't answer me. I prayed for him to heal my toe last week, my toe still hurts, he's not going to answer me, he's not going to respond. No, it says, ask for wisdom. And if you believe when you ask for wisdom, he will give you wisdom. Period, point blank, end of the story, you know. Um, And there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. And I've tried to think about it and I've tried to like contextualize it. Like knowledge is knowing that if I touch the stove, you know in your head, I'm going to burn my hand. But wisdom is like completely understanding the consequences of it, like Not only do I know the stove is hot, and I know that if I touch it, it will hurt, but, like, I have the wisdom to understand that it's going to hurt for a moment. It's going to hurt for hours. I'm going to have to have a bandage. It's like the full and complete understanding of it, whether it be because you've done it and you know, like, hey, 
putting your hand, it hurts. Like, I, getting burnt hurts. Or whether it's seeing someone else. Like, I watched Mike walk up and put his hand on the stove, and now I see that he's hurt. I see that he has a bandage. Wisdom is being able to look at that situation and be like, I don't want to do that. And you can apply that to the Bible because there is almost nothing that we will go through in this world life situation that somebody hasn't already gone through and it hasn't been put in the Bible for us to read. Now, it may not be exact. They didn't have social media back then. They didn't have online bullying. They didn't have all the things, but they still dealt. People are people. Humans go through cycles, and those cycles are the same and have been the same forever and ever since Adam and Eve, and they will be the same until the world passes away. We experience things through the filter of our brain, through what we see, what we feel, through our emotions, and we go in circles and we go in cycles. And if you can learn to see the patterns, it will save you a lot of trouble. I learned more. You can ask my mom, my dad. I learned more from watching my brother do dumb stuff than I could ever learn from anybody else, from any book, any Bible. My brother, I, God rest his soul, he was... I loved him. To, I, I, now looking back, there was a lot of times that we missed, a lot of hard times that we could have connected more. But I learned more from watching him do everything wrong. Because he was the kind that, like, if you told him, don't put your hand on the stove, he's like, bet. I'm about to put my hand on that stove, and I'm going to prove to you that it doesn't hurt. And then he puts his hand on the stove to get burnt, and then he blames the stove for being hot. Like, it just, But it was growing up under that. I watched, and I was like, got it. Don't do that. Check. Learn, lesson learned. Don't do that. I gained wisdom from watching that, and then also from having a dad who told me my entire life, there is a lesson in everything. Learn the lesson. Pay attention. If you're going to get firewood from the shed, not only are you going to go get firewood, but we're going to learn math. Because you're going to go, we need 20 logs, and you can only carry two how many trips are you going to have to make? Like, that was just everything. Didn't matter what it was. It was always a lesson, always and forever. And it programmed my brain to see that. And now, like I said, been around this thing, Christian, long time, I've seen the patterns over and over and over again. You see people, they show up, they get saved, they're on fire, they're loving God, they're in that emotional state, like when you first get married. It's all emotional, and it's exciting, and it's fleshly, and it's great, and all these things. But then... The emotions wear off a little bit, and you start getting into that cycle of, well, I'm saved, and it was exciting for, you know, a month or two, but now people look at me and expect me to act differently, and the Christians around me expect me to act a certain way, and church put these requirements on me that may or may not be even what God wants for me, but they put these things and parameters around me, and they want me to act a certain way, and I can't live up to it, and I try and I fail, and I try and I fail, and eventually people look at it, and they're like, well, I can't live up to Pastor David's expectations for me, or I can't live up to my wife's expectations for me of being a Christian or whatever it is. I keep failing. I keep messing up. I keep doing things wrong. It doesn't work. God's not real. I'm out of here. Or it doesn't work. Pastor David's mean. I don't like the way he preaches. There's a church three, half a mile down the road. I'll go there. And then you get there and it's, man, I love this church. I love these people. The praise and worship's great. I love everything. Six months later, I don't like that pastor. He said something I don't like. I don't like this X, Y, and Z. There's another church half a mile down the road. And then you watch people. You'll see them. Because, you and yeah, I mean, we're friends on Facebook. You know, with, I don't post on Facebook. But you can see, like, hey, they're at this church. Cool, great, grand. Six months later, hey, they're at this church. Hey, they're at that church. And then eventually it's, hey, they're not at church, clearly. It happens. Cycles over and over and over again. And if, as you're walking through your Christian walk, at some point, you got to realize that I lack wisdom, right? Amen. I lack wisdom. Maybe I should ask God for wisdom, right? And then go into verse 9. Let the brother in, brother in humble circumstances, or Christian, in humble circumstances, glory in his high position. Wait, what? Let the brother in humble circumstances... Glory in his high position. Are you reading that? Let the person in humble circumstances, the person that doesn't have all the money, the person that's poor, the person that's low down on the totem pole, let them glory in their high position. 
And in mine, in the brackets, it says, as a born-again believer called to, to the true riches and to be an heir of God. So those of you in here that maybe you're not in the greatest place in life, maybe you feel like you are at the bottom of the totem pole, everybody's trampling over you, God's answer to that is glory in your high, or yeah, glory in your high position. Like celebrate your high position because in God's kingdom, everything's backwards and upside down. I think he enjoys it. It's one of those things like the upside down kingdom. He likes doing things differently. The lowest will be exalted. The exalted will be humbled. And he's saying when you're in those low circumstances, you're in the middle of your trial, you're in the middle of your mess, you're not making the amount of money that you want to be making. You're not living where you want to be living. Your kids are living in hell. Your marriage is falling apart. He's saying stop for a second and glory or celebrate your high position because your high position is that you're a born-again believer called to the true riches and to be an heir of God. And the flip side of that is, and the rich man is to glory in being humbled. You should be excited as a rich man to be humbled or as somebody who's got it all together or living on the mountaintop. It doesn't have to be finances. But it's saying, as a rich man is to glory in being humbled. And it says, by trials revealing human frailty, knowing true riches are found in the grace of God. For like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Saying, first of all, in nowhere in there does he say that there's anything wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with being successful. It's not what he's saying. He's not saying that if you're a successful person, you're wrong. Or if you're making good money, that you're wrong. But what he is saying is that you should glory in those circumstances and times where you're humbled a little bit. Where your finances, you may have everything in order and you get hit a little bit and your finances drop and it makes you a little nervous. And you're like, oh man, you know, I don't, I don't like seeing that small of a number in my bank account. Or my business was making X amount of million dollars a month last year and now I'm making that in a year or half of that over an entire year. Like your businesses will get hit. And he's saying to be happy about those things glory in being humbled because what he's showing you is finances are nothing money is nothing i've heard somebody say it and it's kind of true when you think about it but money is nothing but fun coupons that's all it is it's you work your life and you do all these things you trade in your time for a piece of paper that somebody gives you or not even a piece of paper anymore a number on a computer screen that somebody says somewhere you have x amount of dollars like yes you need money in this life to live and to buy things and survive. I understand that. But at the end of the day, when you pass away, when your finances fall apart, whatever, whatever happens, like I said, birth, taxes, death, those, those are guaranteed, right? So when you die, your money goes to someone else. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, and if you don't have somebody else to take your money, the government will happily step in and just take control of that for you. And don't you worry, we'll handle it just how we feel appropriate. Money is nothing. Money, it, it's, it's nothing in the grand eternal scheme of things. What matters much, much more is your soul. So he's not saying that the rich man is wrong or in sin or a bad person for being successful. What he's saying is, you need to look at those times where you get hit or you get reminded like, oh, man, money, money is kind of funny. It, it comes and goes. It goes ups and down. Tomorrow I could wake up and it could all be gone. But at the end of it, what you should realize is that you're his. You're adopted into his kingdom. You're an heir of his. And at the end of this life, when you die, your soul will go to your spirit will go to heaven. Your body will decay. And you're going to step into riches that we have no understanding of or no concept of. Money doesn't matter to God, so much so that he paves his, road with, or his roads with gold just because he's like, eh, whatever, I don't care. It's just a shiny yellow rock. You think it's pretty, so I'm going to pave my streets with it. Like, that, he, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to him. What matters is you. What matters is your soul. What matters is that lost person that you work with. What matters is your kids that you're raising, that you raise them appropriately so that they learn to love God at an early age and they stay with him. Those are the things that matter. Money is nothing. Um, and in continuing along with that, it says, For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass. Its flowers fall off and its beauty fades away. So too will the rich man in the midst of pursuits fade away. Again, it's not bad to be rich, but understand that that money that you're so confident and you're so proud of and that you flash around with your big you know, truck, with your big wheels or whatever, it's okay to take your money and be like show off what God has done for you. That is okay. 
But if it's about the money, it's about the things, it's about the house, if it's about the cars, God's going to allow you to be shaken a little bit so that you remember that that money, those finances, they're not important. That's not the point. And if it is the point, then that it might all very well go away sooner than you would like so that you really do remember to get things in perspective and in order that God is first and everything else will work itself out. Skipping on to 12, we'll get off money because that is the quickest way to make people not want to listen to you speak anymore. Um, blessed or happily, spiritually prosperous, prosperous, favored by God is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres, as that word again, when tempted. For when he has passed the test and has been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So, again, we're back to this. We're back to blessed is the man who's steadfast under trial and perseveres when tempted. Again, not if tempted, not if you have to go through this, when it will happen, all those things. But you're blessed. And it says right here, this is important because we have messed this up in church. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. So you don't get to say, he just, I mean, that, and James makes it clear, like, hey, you're going to go through things, but when you're going through it, don't step back and be like, man, God really is tempting me, because we've messed that up. People say that, I hear it all the time, God's putting me through it, he's, he's tempting me right now, you know, he's, he's, I'm going through this trial, God's testing me, God's testing me. No, you're going through the trial, I mean, it literally says right here, um, if I can find it. Pass away and kind of promise to love him. Let no one say he's tempted. I'm being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. And then it goes on to say, and this is the section that I preached out of last time I preached. It says, For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. So God can't be tempted, and he doesn't tempt anybody. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire or lust passion. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. So there's, again, a process. There's a process with everything with God. Same thing comes with temptation and sin and death and all those things, death being separation from God. He's saying, each one is tempted when he's dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desires. So temptation, desires, the, the sin that we go through, temptation, trials and all those things, they don't start from God being like, I am going to have Danny just deal with being an alcoholic. I'm just saying a big, that's like the common one. I don't really care. Just trying to think of a good example. I'm going to have Danny be, deal with being an alcoholic, so I'm going to put that on him. When he's born, I'm going to put in a spirit of alcoholism in him. God doesn't do that. What happens is through life, Danny is enticed or lured away. He sees something and says, man, that looks like fun. Because alcohol is presented in a way that looks fun, right? It looks, it looks great, fun, whatever. He's enticed by that. That desire becomes a, um, it conceives in his heart to do that. So then he starts drinking, whatever. Eventually, it doesn't start with a sin, but eventually that drinking leads to sin. I'm not saying that if you have a sip of alcohol that you're a sinner. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in this particular case, hypothetical Danny over here, because I know I can talk about Danny and it's fine. Eventually, that desire to drink and have fun, somewhere down the road, it changes over and becomes a sin. Because it changes from just a desire to do something to it controlling his life. Because that can happen and does happen. But it gives birth, and then it gives birth to sin. So it conceives, the desire conceives in his heart gets in there, it gives birth to sin, that sin grows, runs its course, grows, becomes an adult, whatever it may be, and it give, gives birth to death. A lot of you guys in here have been around Pastor Todd for years. He preached the sin babies, same, same thing. Like those little small sins start as a desire in your heart for whatever it may be. We're flesh. We have desires that don't line up with God. We will have desires that don't line up with God. From the day we're born until the day we die. Because we're born into a sinful world. We, are, we live in a sinful flesh. Our flesh is the enemy of God. It cannot be subject to the things of God. It can't. The only way is just to continually renew your mind. 
with Scripture. You should be renewing your mind, reading the Word, praying, all those things. But you'll never completely put your flesh under and never put it down to where it only wants the things of God. It, it, can't, it won't happen. We live in a sinful flesh. So those desires that you have start out as small desires, and then they grow, and eventually they conceive and give birth to sin. The sin, it doesn't start as a sin. You're catching that, right? Like I, I want to make sure you're seeing that. The desire to do something is not a sin. The desire to do something that doesn't line up with God's will is not a sin. It becomes a sin when you don't deal with it as a desire and you allow it to conceive in your heart. Once it conceives and it begins growing and more and more controls your life and controls your life, then you kind of, that's how you wake up and you're like, oh my God, how did I get here? Like I am in the midst of addiction and bondage and I don't even know the last time I opened my Bible. I don't know the last time I went to church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian, but it definitely helps along with the process. Being around people that are Christians, it helps you with the process, but that's how you end up in the gutter or at rock bottom. You don't just start here and then transfigure yourself down to the rock bottom, just like we talked about going straight up to the mountain. It's all a process. Up's a process and down's a process. If you don't deal with it early enough along the process, that's how it conceives, gives birth, grows, controls your life, and eventually chokes you out and kills you. But it doesn't happen overnight. And God gives you wisdom to deal with that thing along the way. All you have to do is ask, right? Ask for wisdom. And he'll give it to you. Um, do not be misled by brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. And I highlighted this in there because it's one of those things like, that I've heard, and then like you go through your Christian life and you forget. But it says there's no shadow or variation in his turning. So literally what it's saying is, yeah, you may go through these times where you're dealing with stuff, and it may feel like God has turned his back on you. But even if God chose to turn his back on you, when he turns around, there's no shadow, there's no variation. He doesn't change because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So even if he turns his back on you, he's still facing you. Because he's God and he's eternal and he, there's no variation. He cannot turn his back on you. Even when you're in the midst of sin, he cannot turn his back on you. He's there waiting on you. What happens is when you get into sin and you get yourself separated, you allow yourself to be separated from God with your sin. God's still standing there waiting on you. Just like the prodigal father, he's standing there waiting. The second that you come to yourself and the second you say, I'm coming back to God. Doesn't my father have servants who are eating better than I am? The second that you decide, I'm coming back, he sees you afar off. He runs to you, puts a robe on you, puts a ring on your finger, makes you an heir back into his kingdom. Like, at no point during that did the father look at his son and be like, you idiot. I gave you your entire life's wealth, and you burned through it, and he never addresses it, never speaks of it. Nothing. He gives him a robe, gives him a ring, says, my son's back, kill the fatted calf. That is how God comes to you when you come back. If you allow yourself to get separated with sin and all those things, the moment that you come to him and say, God, I'm sorry, before you can even get the words out of your mouth, he's already forgotten it, cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, forgiven you, put a robe on your shoulders, put a ring on your finger and says, somebody kill the fatted calf, they're back. I'm so excited. My son's back. My daughter's never addresses your sin because he's already addressed your sin. Jesus died for your sin. That's already done. We get so caught up with, God, I messed up. God, I messed up. I did this wrong. I cussed when this guy cut me off in traffic. I wanted to run him off the road. I thought those bad thoughts in my head. I watched that thing on the Internet or I watched that TV show or I listened to that thing, and I feel bad and I feel dirty. That's the enemy Speaking through your sin, saying, yeah, you are dirty. You are messed up. You did mess up. You should, God doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. But the reality is, the moment you say in your heart, God, I'm sorry, before you can even get it out of your mouth, he's already forgotten about it, gotten rid of it, brought you back in and made you a son. Like, it, it doesn't matter. He's already covered all those things. The things that we get so hung up on as Christians, the things we get hung up on, the big three, 
sex, drugs, rock and roll. You know, all the things people get so focused on. They're like, oh my gosh, these things are terrible. They're awful. You shouldn't do them. God, he's already dealt with it. He's already dealt with it. It's already gone, forgiven, before you can ever do it. So quit getting hung up on your little mistakes that you make along the way. And remember that this is a process of endurance, right? The Christian race, from the moment you're saved until the moment you die, it is a, a race that you must run. You know, you're going through it. There are going to be days where you can go out and you can run 10 miles, and it's fine, and you feel fantastic. And there are going to be days where you get three steps out your door and you say, I don't want to do this. I hate this. My legs hurt. My feet hurt. I'm tired. I don't want to be a good Christian today. I don't want to smile at this person. I don't want to be nice to my coworker because they're a jerk. I don't want to be respectful to my boss because they're, it doesn't matter. God at, commands you to do those things, to be respectful, to be loving to the people around you because you're the only example of God that most people will ever see, especially in today's world. You're the, you're the best chance they got. They don't see it. They don't watch TBN. They're not watching that. They don't watch YouTube videos of pastors preaching unless they're watching it to make fun of them because they look silly. Like, they, they don't see God. They don't want to see God. In today's social media world, like, they don't see anything of God other than the time they spend with Danny or the time they spend with Mike or the time they spend with me. Like, whoever it is, you're the closest thing to God they're ever going to see. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect. What it does mean is if they see you fall, if they see you stumble, that they see you handle that appropriately and walk through it, and they see, man, man, God, you know, they didn't walk away from being a Christian just because they messed up. Like, I saw them. I saw them have a baby before they were married, or I saw them whatever it is. Like, I saw them in the bar last night, and they were trashed. And that kind of ruins your influence a little bit. But if they see you walk through that process and then six months from then they don't see you in the bar anymore or they don't see you getting trashed anymore or they don't see you, whatever it is. It, the bar is just an easy example. Drinking is just an easy example to plug in. Like, don't get hung up on what I'm using as an example. But if they see you walk through those sin and that endurance process, they see you constantly going up, getting closer and closer to the Lord. They don't see this They see you constantly improving. You may level out for a minute. You may dip down for a little bit, but then six months from then you're improving. If they see that, that's more of a witness than crashing down. I'm taking way too long for this, so y'all just hang with me. We'll be out of here in just a minute. Um, there's no variation no right, um, or shadow casting his turning because he doesn't turn his back on you, and even if he does turn his back on you, he's still facing you. It was his own will that he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creations. A prime example of what he created to be set apart to himself, sanctified, made holy. There you go. That's literally what we were just talking about. Like you are the prime example of the one that he set apart. That's why you're here. That's why he chose you. That's why he forgave you. That's why he sent his son to die for you because you are that example to those around you. Skipping down to verse 19 or the next verse, whatever. Understand this, my beloved. Brothers and sisters, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the um, anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, that standard of behavior which he requires from us. Um, I do want to read this real quick. I put this in here. Um, another, I believe it was another note. Yeah, it was another note from my Bible. I love it. I think it's great. It says this verse, when it's talking about anger, it says this verse speaks to anger that comes from a place where egos are bruised. And I put on here, when ego gets involved and egos get involved and aren't checked, they inevitably will get bruised, which can lead to anger and offense. That's where anger comes from, offense comes from, when he's talking about quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Because if you hear that somebody said something about you and you've got your ego involved, and you think you're all that and that you're so much better than them, and you hear that so-and-so said something about you, that's where that ego comes in, gets bruised, you get offended, you get angry. And God's saying be slow, quick to hear. So, like, be careful, thoughtful listener. Hear what people are saying. Listen to what they're saying. But be slow to speak. And that is one thing that I've tried to work on my whole life. I've been thankful for it because I tend to be one that will sit and listen. Like, you can tell me things all day, and that's fine. I'll listen to you. I may not say anything. I'm going to sit back and watch. That's, that's my personality. Like, 
you tell me you love the church and you love this place and you love Pastor David and you are here and you're in it for the long haul, I can say as somebody who's been here since, I'm not, since I was nine, I'll be 35 this year, I've heard that statement so many times, I can't even tell you. And of all the people that I've heard say it, there's very few that are sitting in this room. It's one of those things. People say things, but sit back and listen. But it can also apply to you when people tell you things. You hear somebody, hey, so-and-so said this about you. You can hear it. Don't speak on it. Don't put your mouth on it. Sit back and listen. And it says slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiving. So you should be slow to anger. You should be quick to forgive the p people around you in your life. Um, don't let your ego get involved. Um, it's another thing that I have learned, just two-second clip from my life. I've, over the last couple years, I got it interested in jujitsu. It's one of those things, doesn't matter, don't get hung up on that again. It's just something that's fun that I like to do. But one of the things that I've heard so many times since I started that our coach coaches drill into your head is, you cannot have an ego. You can't. Because that's one thing you learn the first day of that particular class is you come in and you get in there and you think you're something. Or you'll go through foundations, which is like your basic, here are the things you need to know to not die when you get to class. And you show up to class because you just finished foundations. You're like the top of that class. So you kind of feel good about yourself. And then you get in there and there are 85-pound girls who are like ripping your arm out of your arm socket. And you're like, okay, well... My ego is gone. I got nothing, nothing. But it's important to learn because you may think you're all that, and you may think you've been through some things, but somebody has it worse. Somebody's been through it. Don't let your ego get involved and say, well, I walked through what Danny's walking through right now, and I didn't fall away. I didn't sin. Well, you don't know what Danny's walking through. You may see what the world sees, but you don't know where he's at. You may see... A marriage that you're like, well, we went through that same thing and we didn't get divorced or we didn't separate or you, you know, whatever it is. It's easy to say that and look and see that, but be slow to put your mouth on it. Nice way of saying it, just keep your mouth shut. Just leave it alone. Because as soon as you start to talk about it, you're putting your, you're interjecting yourself into that. And you're like putting it out there to the world like, hey, I can handle that. I can handle that, no problem. Well, guess what? Eventually, you're going to hit that bump in the road that they just hit, and you're not going to be so big in ego. But, yeah, slow, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the resentful, deep-seated anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger does not produce righteousness, can't produce righteousness, can't do it. Offense, anger, whatever it may be, jealousy, all those things, does not. And then it says, so get rid of all uncleanness. And all that remains of wickedness, and with a humble spirit, receive the word of God, which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your souls. So all he's saying there is get rid of all uncleanness. That's, again, that's a process. It's not something you come to an altar call and somebody prays for you and then boom. Everything in your life that's not clean and doesn't line up with God's word and that he wants gone is just magically gone and you're the perfect Christian forever and ever and amen. doesn't happen. It's a process. You should constantly be trying to get rid of things that are unclean, that God doesn't like, that God doesn't want you to have. And we'll get to that in just a second. But get rid of all uncleanness, wickedness, and with a humble spirit, receive the word of God, which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your souls. These scriptures that we read every week that you memorize, that's not just memorizing for like... Sunday school to check a list off and get a, what are the kids town cash so you can buy something. That's not, it's not what it is. What it is is the more you read it, the more you listen to it, the more you, it becomes implanted in your heart. When something's planted in, it's like an oak tree that has those roots that go super deep down into the ground. When it's implanted in there, wind comes, times happen, you go through those ups and downs that we've talked about, you go through hard times. It doesn't matter what hits you, that tree's not coming down. And even if the tree snaps off at the top and falls, if it's near a good water source and it's rooted into the earth, that thing will start to grow again. It'll start sprouting branches off and start, leaves will start growing again. The new tree will grow out of the old roots. Like it happens all the time. If he implants those words into you and you take, you don't just hear it here, but you implant it, allow it to become implanted in your heart, then 
yeah, you receive the word implanted, which is to save your souls, prove yourself. And then it says right here, then we're going to, this is kind of what we read to begin with. But prove yourselves doers of the word. And it says in brackets, actively and continually obeying God's precepts and not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meanings. Deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning contrary to the truth. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying, uh, without obeying it, he is like a man who looks carefully into his natural face, at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what he looked like. But he who looks carefully into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and faithfully abides by it, not having become a careless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he will be blessed and favored by God in what he does in his life of obedience. So it gives you this idea that the word of God, scripture, hearing the word preached, reading the Bible, listening to worship music, all those things, it creates a mirror in your life. It creates this mirror that you look into. And when you look in that mirror, you see yourself, yes, just like if you walked into a mirror, if I held a mirror up or we turned the cameras around and you could all see your own face. But it's more than that. It's a mirror that reflects who you are now. But it also, when you look at it and it is applying scripture to it, it shows who you're meant to be. It shows who Jesus says you're supposed to be. It shows what God wants you to be. So you see yourself, but you also see yourself as God wants you to be seen, as he wants you to be, as he wants you. So when you're looking in that mirror, you're looking at yourself and you see, I see me, I see Cody, but I see Cody at the same time the way God wants me to be. I see where I'm at, I see where he wants me to be, but I also can see where I was. That's where that, where scripture comes in so important and when it's rooted in your heart because when you're looking at your life and you're looking at your situations and you're looking at your face, what he's saying is you see your successes, your failures, all those things, but you're also looking at it through the lens of the word of God. And you're looking at it and seeing like, God, this is where I'm at. This is how I handled that situation. But I'm looking through the lens of your scripture and I see where Jesus told me I should have handled it this way. Or this is how I dealt with that lustful spirit thought I had in my head that I allowed to come to fruition and I ended up watching something I shouldn't have watched or listening to something I shouldn't listen or going home with that person I shouldn't have gone home with. Whatever it may be, doesn't matter. Plug in your example there. Anger, frustration, bitterness turns into all the things. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But what you're, you're looking at is how you handled it, but then you can see through the reflection of the Word of God how He says you should have handled it. The question is, when you turn away from that mirror and you walk away, do you remember what you saw or do you immediately forget what you saw? You heard the word. You heard the correct way to handle things. You heard, read, saw Jesus' teaching, saw the Old Testament, how God wants you to handle things. When you turn away from that mirror and start to walk off, do you remember what you saw? Are you that guy he's talking about here that looks at themselves in the mirror, studies their face, looks, sees it, sees what they look like, sees their gray hair, sees their pimples, sees their color of their eyes, sees their ears, everything. They see it. And then the second they turn away, they're like, I don't even know what I look like. Like, I could walk by a picture of me right now and be surprised that that's me. And that's what he's saying. If you're a hearer only, you're not applying the things to your life. You're not applying what he's given you to work on. That's how silly it is, is to look at yourself in the mirror and study your face. Not just like pass by a mirror and see it, but like to really study and to look and see every aspect of who you are and then turn and walk away. And that's how we get that plastic surgery church that Pastor David's been talking about. People look at themselves in the mirror and they want the quick, easy fix that we talked about earlier. They, want the, they don't want to go through the process. They want to pay the money and have the injections and have the plastic surgery and the this and the that and get the hair dye and all the things. They want the quick, easy thing in the spiritual. They want, they want the miracle out of their circumstance. They don't want to go through the process. Don't let yourself be that person who looks in the mirror, who hears the word spoken to you, who when you look in there, you're like you should look in the mirror in this theoretical sense and hear Pastor David's preaching and hear him saying like, this is the way you should handle that. This is the way you shouldn't handle that. This is what God says about this. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to be successful. He loves you. He 
like we were talking about earlier with the prodigal father that was quick to come back. That's how God views you. He loves you. He this, he that. And then turn around and walk away, and immediately you think, God hates me. He doesn't love me. My neighbors hate me. They don't like me. Cameron talks about me behind my back all the time. You know, he hasn't this, he hasn't that. Like, you immediately just plug in whatever is going on in your head, and you forget everything that he just said. You forget that you're a son. You forget that you're a daughter, that you're chosen, an heir, all the things, immediately. So don't be that person, but you should be a doer of the word. You should hear the things that are said and apply it to your life. It's like getting in the shower and taking a shower and never applying soap. You'll get some of the dirt off, maybe, but you're not going to get clean. You're not going to scrub the oils and the, the grime and the germs away. You're just going to let some water wash over you, and you're, out and you're still going to stink. You're still going to have dirt on you. You're still going to have greasy hair. Like, you didn't apply the soap. You didn't apply the shampoo. He's giving you the tools. You're just not applying it. That is what Scripture is. It is the tools to line your life up with the way he wants. You can live your life however you want, and you can live your Christian life however you want, and you can die and go to heaven and make it into heaven and never improve from day one until day dead. Like, you, you can live your entire timeline here on earth from salvation until death and apply almost nothing and die and go to heaven. But what is the point? Like, yeah, you don't go to hell, but... Last time I checked, we're all still here. We're alive. Why not improve our lives now? Become a better Christian now. Become a better father now. Become a better husband now. Apply the scriptures to our life like soap and wash away the things that we don't need. And then when we go on to heaven, we've become the best versions of ourselves that we possibly can through God's help, through the wisdom that we're supposed to ask for, right? Um, yeah, so be active doers. Apply all the things. And then the last... Two scriptures, y'all can all say thank the Lord. Robin, if you want to come play, you can. I went a little bit farther than I thought I would, but we're doing good. All 27 scriptures, we're almost there. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not control his tongue but deludes his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, so like religion, the thing that we always, in charismatic churches a lot of times we like to bash religion it's pointless it's dumb it's silly it's rules it's regulations all those things this is where we kind of get that from if you think yourself to be religious but you can't control your tongue and delude your own heart meaning you're not listening to those things that have been implanted into your heart you're watering it down you're convincing yourself that those things aren't real um this person's religion is worthless or futile or barren and then it says pure and unblemished religion as it expressed in outward acts in the sight of God our Father is this to visit and look after the fatherless and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself uncontaminated by the secular world so that's religion gets this bad rap it gets all these things but that's because we're not doing it right religion where you can't control your tongue what you say about people what you say about the pastor, what you say about those around you, if you can't keep your tongue under control, I don't care how religious you are, is worthless. If you can't control how you react to people coming to you, that's, that's kind of the idea of the tongue, like how you react when somebody, when you go through tough times of life, how you react when you see somebody else go through tough times of life, all those things. Your religion is useless if you cannot control your tongue and you allow your own heart to be deluded so like those things that you get you hear every week being preached you read in the Bible if you allow those to be deluded in your heart it's useless it does you no good but pure and unblemished religion when it comes to outward acts like things we do religion in the sight of God is to visit and look after the fatherless and the widows so to take care of people who are going through hard times to love those people around you it doesn't just mean fatherless and widow, widows like people who their dad have died and their husbands passed away that's not ex what it's saying what it's saying is people that are going through a hard time in those days they had no safety net they had no welfare they had no any of that so if you were a woman and your husband died or your father died before you were married or whatever it may be your only hope was to go and sit on the corner and beg or to sell your body or to do those natural things that people had to do so there was no safety net for those people so that's what he's saying. He's like, true religion, if you want to look at it in outward acts, 
is loving the people around you. So when you see somebody going through something, going through hell on earth, their marriage is falling apart, their kids are not behaving, they're out of work, they're, they have no self-esteem because of this, that, and the other, they're at the bottom, they're, they're falling apart. Don't judge them. Keep your tongue off of it, right? Shut your mouth. Unless you can say something loving or caring, just shut your mouth. Don't say anything. Walk through that with them. Love them through that situation. That's step one. And the other step, of, other side of it is keep oneself uncontaminated by the secular world, which sounds easy on paper. Don't get tainted. Don't get dirty. Don't get from the people around you. But in reality, it's a lot harder than it sounds. That's like Jesus with the woman they brought her, brought him, brought her to him in adultery, and she was caught, red-handed, in trouble. They had every right to stone her, and he deals with it. He says, you know, let the first one without sin throw the first stone, and people walk away. And he's like, hey, where's your accusers? You have none. Cool. Go and sin no more. That sentence, that statement, sounds easy on paper. But it's a lot harder than it sounds. Go and go and sin no more. Go and be uncontaminated by the secular world. But that's what he says. There's a difference between walking in the world and like bumping into the things of the world and then applying that soap that we talked about and not letting it get all over you and being contaminated by it. Allowing it to get on you, to get in you, to get into your spirit, to run through your veins, to get into your blood. There's a big difference between the two. But at the end of the day, love the people around you. Love your neighbors, love your family, love your friends. If you can't say anything nice, don't say it, right? We're talking like we're talking to kids again. It's amazing how that works. If you have nothing nice to say, if you see somebody going through something and you think you know better, shut your mouth. Until you can lovingly walk through it with them. Love them during their mess. Like if Jesus wouldn't have said it to them, you don't need to say it to them. And you can say, well, well Jesus went into the church and was flipping tables and beating people with whips. You missed the first part of that statement. He went into the church and did those things. And he did those things to the leaders of the church. He didn't do it to the people that were coming in. He never addressed the people that were buying the doves. He was upset with the church leaders who were selling a fake gospel, a discounted gospel that didn't cost you anything. He was upset with those people. He didn't address the people that were coming in because those people were led to believe that that was acceptable. But Jesus didn't deal with those people. So if you can't lovingly deal with people that are in the middle of their mess, just keep your mouth shut. It's the easiest thing to do. Just keep your mouth shut. And then if you've been through that and you can walk through it with them, walk through it with them in love. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger, ask for wisdom, have endurance to go through the things you're going through. And let's all just walk through this thing together a little bit better. So guys, you can stand prayer and altar workers you can come I know it wasn't the most exciting like revelatory let me find one scripture and preach on it for 30 minutes but I'm kind of over those things I'll be honest with you I've gotten to a place like we said earlier I've been through I've been a part of ministry since I was born I've been around this thing my whole life and I've seen the exciting flashy things and the lights and the loud music and I've seen the all the flashy things I've seen it and they they get people there for a moment but they don't keep them it's like Pastor David has said over and over again we as a church Pastor David this leadership we love you too much to get you excited for a second and then just leave you where you are we want to see you walk through this thing I want to see when I'm Let's fast forward when I'm 55, 65, 70. I want to see you guys still here. Unless you've died and gone to heaven, I want to see you still here. I want to see your kids still here. I want to see your grandkids still here. I want to see you walking through this thing. Does that mean those 25, 35, 45 years will be perfect? No. But we want to see you still here, still in this thing, making a difference in your life, raising your kids to be world changers, being a part of the process. So in just a second, I'm going to pray. If you guys want to come down for any, you need prayer for anything, doesn't matter what it is. If you feel like you're 
one of those that are just too dirty to be loved. You've gone through too much. You've done too much. And you, you feel like God judges you. Hopefully what we talked about gives you a little insight to the fact that God forgives you before you ever ask. But if you need that forgiveness, come down and pray with somebody. They're, they're not working magic. They're not doing some crazy formula. They just want to believe with you and pray with you. And if nothing else, just listen to you and love on you and be Jesus with skin on. Like we, you know, we say today. So if you need prayer for anything, these altar prayer and altar workers are down here. God, we love you. I hope that the words that I've spoken today have found their way into the, the people here's hearts, God that you would speak to them through my words, that you have spoken to them through my words, that you would show them that, yes, this thing is a process, but it's a process that we have to walk together with other people, that you love them, that you've provided for them, you give, you're willing to give them wisdom, you're willing to walk through these things with them, God. I pray that you would bless Pastor David, whether he's preaching now or he's already preached or whatever, God, that you would flow through him, that you would use him to, to speak your word, Father God, we know you are, but I pray that you would use him mightily this morning, or have already used him mightily, God, we thank you for the gift that Pastor David and Pastor Stephanie and their family are to this place, Lord, I pray for each person that's represented here, each family that's represented here, that they would be blessed, that you would be with them, that you would stay with them, God, that you would show yourself powerful in their life, God, I pray people come down to this altar and they, they pray with these prayer and altar workers, God, that you would touch them. I thank you that you're going to touch them, Jesus, that you're going to rearrange things in their, their hearts and their minds and show them the right way to walk, that you would give them wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Make sure you come back next week when Pastor David will be here. We love you guys. If you need prayer, go ahead and